here. There we go. And let me open up chapter 10. So that is what we are reading today. The little book. That's kind of the, the focus here. Uh, a little book or a little scroll uh, that is going to be presented to John. So let's start right at the beginning. Does someone want to read the first three verses? Revelation 10, 1 to 3. I saw. I saw. Oh, we got to Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sophia. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. All right. So quite a lot of information just within the first three mm. verses, right? <clears throat> um, so the first thing that we see is this mighty angel, right? Now, again, the word angel is a title, right? It simply means messenger. So a mighty messenger came down from heaven. Uh, and then we get a bit of a description. He's clothed with a cloud. Uh, there's a rainbow around his head. His face shines like the sun. And his feet are like pillars of fire. All right. Um, is that Jesus? It's a good question, right? Uh, because when we looked at like Revelation 1, for instance, we kind of get this image of God and, and it's kind of similar, right? We have the rainbow, yeah. except the rainbow's around the throne. We get that, that the legs of kind of burning brass, that shiny brass. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact that his face is, is shining like the sun. Um, what's strange is that it's called, he is called an angel, right? It's called, yeah. so it doesn't say, uh, the son of man or the son of God or, you know, the lamb of God, nothing like that. It, it, it keeps it kind of a little bit hidden with Maybe this idea Gabriel. of an angel, uh, possibly Gabriel, right? Um, what's important is that he's the one that has this little book, right? Mm -hmm. um, he's the one that has this, this little book and... Then he steps on, with his right foot he goes on the sea, and with his left foot on the land. Um, now, I'll give you the traditional understanding of that. If someone has a, a newer interpretation, you can let me know. Um, usually, we'll, we'll see in Revelation that the sea symbolizes many people, mm -hmm. populated areas, and dry land would then be the opposite, right? Kind of uh, deserted places, places that don't have a lot of people. Uh, if he has his foot on the sea and on the land, then what that would mean is this message, this little book that he has is for everyone, whether you're in the big cities, whether you're off in the country, wherever you are in the world, the message in this little book is for you, right? Uh, so that's the traditional view. Um, any Anyone else has, have you read anything differently or... Or compared it with maybe another verse somewhere. Anyone? Well, I, I um, my understanding is the same from based on what I've read from some of the other commentaries. Okay, so yeah, I don't think there's that big of a deviation there. Where it gets really interesting, however, is when when he cries out with a loud voice, and his voice is like a lion's roar which again kind of does have that little image of Jesus, right? Jesus is known as the Lion of Judah and so on. Um, so it's there's, there's quite a lot of information on, on this mighty angel, this mighty messenger. Uh, but when he cries out, it says that seven thunders uttered their voices, right? So there was seven messages. There was these seven statements or something right? There was these seven thunderings, these seven voices, um, which is going to be the only thing in the entire book of Revelation that's going to be hidden from us. 
all right? Uh, everything in the book of Revelation, Ken has mentioned this, you know, quite a few times already. The purpose of this book is to open the books for us, right? To give us information, to, to let us know kind of what, what's been secret, right? To tell us the future. The only exception in the entire book is this right here, all right? Uh, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Uh, and let me read verse four here. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. So John was about to write those seven messages, right? He was about to let us know what those seven messages were. But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Ask, uh, excuse me. Can I have uh, ask a question here? Yes. Um, what is the significance? Two questions, actually. What is the significance of the left foot being on the um, land and the right foot being on the sea? And secondly, um, was the little scroll different from this other scroll? Uh, okay, so the, the feet one, I th <coughs> we think we know. Most people agree on this one. So the fact that he has his foot on the sea, which represents many people or populated no, the areas. Left, not the foot, the left foot. The on left the foot. Right foot. Um, on there. Is there a significance to that? Not that we know of. Usually the right is the dominant, right? So Jesus always puts the good on the right side, right? Uh, Jesus sits at the right side of God. Um, but here, uh, I think this is just a detail that John wrote, right? Because okay. you have to remember, um, God isn't telling John this. John is seeing this happen, right? So if he sees the left foot on the sea, and the, that's what he's going to write down. So I, I think it's, you know, it had to be one of the feet, right? But I think right. the, the, the main purpose here is that it was on both, right? Okay. Both the sea and the land. As far as I know, I've never read anything that explains that anyways. Okay. Uh, and then the second thing is that it, it looks like this is a different book. All right. It doesn't seem to have any connection. Um, in fact, when you go back, let me see here. Uh, yeah, this is just called a little book or a little scroll. I think uh, probably the King James says um, open in his hand. And again, this one is open, right? It's not sealed. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that. This is an open book which this angel has. Right uh, now, we, it is going to explain a little bit more what that book is. But up until now, it's it's very much everything's kind of a mystery. The mighty angel is a bit of a mystery. The book is a bit of a mystery, and then these seven thunderings are in, are a mystery. And unfortunately, uh, at least with the seven thunders, we're never given an explanation, right? Shut we're up, never sir. told. Yeah, go ahead, Lynette. I read the right foot. The sea is turbulence, and the left foot on the land is seen as stable bringing all things together on the land okay i i i've never heard that before um i i can't the the only connection i can make with that is the sea was known as kind of uh, a fearful thing for for humans right it's it was always kind of seen as like the enemy you know you have to be beware the sea while the land obviously is a lot more secure. Uh, but I don't know of any verses specifically that that talk about that difference there. I know within Revelation, it makes it, it actually will tell us, you know, uh, the, the, the seas of which the, the woman, the, the, the harlot was on represents many people's nations and, and uh, you know, populated areas. Um, yes. So that, that's what Revelation teaches. It's possible that there could be a secondary meaning um, but it's nothing that I've heard of before, at least. Where did you read that? With the the, the waters? Right. The, where did you get that from, Lynette? Was I read, read, yeah, I read it from a, I read ahead and sometimes I don't remember these things I write. Oh, in, so that's why. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so as the pastor mentioned, the, the message is a universal message. Yeah. because it's for people's nation, languages, tribes, and so on. And so the angel is following the book. It's significant in that this is a revelation for everybody. 
So we can use universal, it would be quite safe. Because remember, Revelation will talk about this quite a bit, this idea of waters and dry land, right? We know the first beast comes out of the water. We know the second beast comes out of the land. Uh, we know the woman runs away to the deserted places, right? To the places without water. And then the devil tries to, you know, pour this water after her. So this image of water and dry land repeats quite often in Revelation. Uh, and so at least in the way I study it, uh, I try to always find, you know, what what's the book? How does the book explain it, right? Uh, if Revelation didn't explain it itself, then yeah, I would branch out to say, okay, how does the rest of the Bible kind of explain what water represents or land? For instance, so something like the trees, right? We talked about the, the trees and the, and the green things. So again, Revelation will actually, actually tells us, right, that... Uh, the, the grass and the trees represents the sealed, right? And everyone else is those that aren't, that don't have the seal. We've read that in a previous verse. Uh, and the Bible itself in Psalms and so on also makes that comparison. So, um, I mean, there might be a verse in the Bible that mentions that. So I'm not gonna say that it's completely wrong, uh, but at least I've never read it. I, I've never come across something that, that reminds me of that. So. But uh, if 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 you go back and you find where you found it, yeah, uh, okay. See, see if you can find out why they say that. See if okay. they give you some verses. Yeah. So e even for next week or whatever. But uh, okay. if in the week you see it, yeah. Uh, all right. So let let's keep going. So we had this mighty angel. We got this little book that's open, and then we have the seven thunders. That. It, it must be an important message, right? For God to say, no, 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 keep this one sealed. Um, so it makes me really wonder what, what was said. Uh, but obviously it wasn't uh, good for us to hear, right? If it was important for us to hear, God would let us hear it. Uh, so obviously it's something that's better for us not to know, right? That's where I guess faith in God comes in. Um so I, I looked up the word thunder in, in the Bible, and these are the only verses that it, it actually appears. Yeah, uh, thunders almost is, is almost always connected to the voice of God, right? So Job 37, mm -hmm. uh, after, it voice, uh, after, after it a voice roars, he thunders with, magic, uh, with majestic voice, and he does not restrain them when his voice is heard. Job 37, 5, God thunders marvelously with his voice. Uh, Psalms 29, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters, which actually does seem connected to this verse, right? Uh, and then Revelation 10, with, which we've read. and read, uh, It's the only time that, uh, that this word thunder appears. It's always connected to the voice of God. Um, so if I had to guess... I would say that the seven thunders, because remember, we, we've talked about the seven spirits already, how they kind of all represent the Holy Spirit. So it's very possible that the seven thunders <laughs> is actually like the voice of God. Uh, so God said something and then, you know, he told John, but but don't let anyone else know this message. So it's uh, it's the one mystery that that isn't explained in Revelation. Everything else. If we study enough, you should be able to figure out what the rest of Revelation means. Any any questions on that before we continue? So this is kind of surprising that the um, from the time of Daniel, the Lord says, well, seal up the book mm -hmm. or the words until the time of the end. Now we've come to the time of the end. <laughs> he says, seal, seal, seal it up. up again, right? Because, so he, he just says, know, don't yeah. write. Yeah, well, but the fact write, that he that's doesn't it. write keeps it sealed, right? Like sealed. we we don't know. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a new message, though, right? So this is something new. Uh, if I had to guess, I would almost guess it's maybe God said when He's coming. Maybe He gave the actual right. Same thing comes to my mind. Yeah, but then He so says, he you know, what? To know this is too gave, dangerous for yeah. you to know, right? So yeah, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna seal yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we may say that's speculation, but that's what comes to mind, and that comes to mind because of. Um, what Ellen White says, she yeah. says, one year before he comes, <laughs> he will actually tell us he's coming. 
And as she says, the voice rolls out throughout the earth like thunder. And it tells us exactly the day he will be coming, one year before the actual time. Mm. So when I read this, so close to the end, because the sixth seal is practically to the end. Yeah, the sixth you know? trumpet. I mean, the sixth, sixth trumpet. trumpet. Yeah. It's, it's done to the end. It's, yeah. um, you know, this is the closing up of, of the work under the sixth trumpet. Uh, especially in chapter um, 11, we'll find. So, so this is very close to the yeah. end of, of all things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with that. Again, we're speculating. We have no, yeah. because it is, it isn't written down, mm. right? But yeah, because we're right at the end of the, you know, right before the seventh trumpet, um, and, you know, the, the, the image of this mighty angel is very godlike, right? There's definitely very kind of godly characteristics there. Uh, so it would make sense that, you know, God speaks and these seven messages, these, you know, this end time message of, of perhaps, you know, this is when it's going to happen um, is revealed. But then just like in Daniel, it says, you know what, it's too early. I, we can't, we couldn't give this. Imagine, imagine if, you know, at uh, 100 AD, Revelation were to, were to tell us, you know, God's only coming in 2022. You know, for, for 2000 years, people would be like, oh, we got time. You know, we don't have to worry about this. And so I think to prevent that, God had to kind of, seal up or, or have John not write what must be a very important message, right? It's important enough for God to say, don't write it, right? So, so that's, that, that's what's interesting here. Um, let's, let's keep going because there's still more to read here. Someone want to read verses five to seven? The angel whom I saw standing on on the sea and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Okay. The reason why I didn't want to say that this angel was God or Jesus or things like that is because in verse six, it said, you know, he swears to God, right? Which kind of gives you that impression that he it wasn't. isn't God himself. Though the Bible does say that, you know, God can swear on himself, right? I, I can swear to myself because I'm God. Um, so it still could be, but the way that it's written kind of, it, it hints at the idea that this really is just an angel, uh, obviously, a, you know, a powerful one, a mighty angel. So maybe Gabriel, um, who, and again, you'll, uh, so Judy here, you'll notice that again, it says that he's standing on the sea and on the land. But this mm -hmm. time he doesn't emphasize which foot, right? The emphasis right. seems to be more just on the fact that it is on the land, on the sea. So yeah. that seems to be kind of more important. Uh, but then he also raises his hand to heaven, right? So you get this, you know. The... I have in my Bible, he raised his right hand. Oh, <clears throat> oh that's interesting. What, what version is that? This is the NIV. The NIV. Ah, okay. I'd have to look that up because that's... Uh, it's strange that it wouldn't be written here if that word is there, right? You think they would add it in. Um, so he lifts up his hand, his right hand, I guess, right to heaven, and then swears by him. And we get a very clear creator image here, right? Creator he lives, land, lives forever and ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and and going back to what Ken said earlier, that, that, that the thunders might be that, you know, that day of when Jesus is coming. We kind of get a message of that, right? The the days of the sounding of the seventh angel are at hand. So it's very much a message of the end is close, right? We are right at the end of this. Uh, so there definitely does seem to be a message of, you know, the second coming. That's definitely an important thing uh, that, that's being proclaimed here. Um, 
and this idea that the mystery of God would be finished, right? This whole yeah, I was just going to mention that uh, yeah, the work of salvation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which is a mystery. Uh, the Bible itself says, because here's the thing: when we talk about the second coming, when we talk about salvation, our minds tend to focus on the positive, right? Those that are going to be saved, going to heaven, uh, being with God. But part of the act of salvation is also judgment, right? It's also killing probably millions, if not billions of people, right? That's why the Bible calls it the great mystery, because it's, it's not a normal thing for God, right? This isn't what God does every day. This is a very rare once in a lifetime, you know, uh, judgment from God. And, and it's a judgment that will never happen again, right? Uh, there's going to be this time of immense, immense death, but then it's also going to be a time where death itself is, is also killed, right? But it's uh, also not really what God wanted, why he sent Jesus. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I think that's why the word even mystery is used here. Uh, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a positive. It's simply just this unimaginable, you know, no one could have predicted this kind of events right uh again it's a, it's a great event for us right for those that are going to be saved it, but uh but the negative is also going to be immense right it's going to be this huge huge event any ideas on, on these three verses here well there's a couple of commentators who expressed their view on the angel and they said this angel is a mighty angel and has the appearance of Christ, but is not Christ. Mm -hmm. They use that uh, because there are several times in the Bible that this mighty angel again is used. Yeah. And in this case, as we read the text, it says, um, he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it. And Jesus, this, this couldn't be Jesus, I mean, Jesus, because Jesus is the creator, as we know from chapter one in John, all yeah. things were created by him. Yeah. So uh, many of the, uh, like John Pauline and so on, says that this Jesus was never referred to as an angel. Yeah. And then in this case, this is just a mighty angel and not Christ himself. Yeah. Uh, the second, that, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, and the second thing about the mystery, the mystery of God, they all interpret as the gospel. Okay? Mm. The gospel will be finished. This is the time under the sixth seal. When the seventh seal is about to be sounded, the gospel is finished. Yeah, everyone is sealed, right? That, that finishing is sealed. work. Yeah. Right, because under the, again, the same incursion or intimation with the seals, God's people are sealed. So this is it. <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the fact that he says, uh, where is it? Uh, the end of verse six, that there should be no more delay any longer, right? So it's very much, you know, that finishing of that work. We're not, you know, we're not going to give you guys another two weeks or another month or another year to save yourself. You know, there, there comes a time where the work finishes, right? There can't be any more delay. And, and Jesus <coughs> you know finish that aspect which is that that salvation the sealing aspect and move into the the judgment part right anyone else on, on these verses here we still got a few more verses if i'm not mistaken i think we'll come back to the reference of that delay because <laughs> that is taken straight out of um daniel chapter 8 mm -hmm. yeah, 10, yeah 300 yeah. days yeah and he's saying now we've come to the end, the ending of time, mm -hmm. or, or the, 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 the ending of that prophecy, the 23 in the day. So time shall be no more. And that's where um, the reference comes in. Of that delay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we've had the, the mighty angel speak, right, and give this proclamation. Now we turn back into this little book, right? Now the focus is going to be on this little book. So does someone want to read verses 8 and 9 for us? Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. 
So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. All right. Now, that's something that we've heard of, you know, before as well, right? This idea of, of eating this book that comes right out of Ezekiel, um, and it's kind of sweet in the mouth, right? Um, so this one, obviously, you see as symbolic, right? So it's it's very much it john is is consuming the message and he's going to give the message out right so it's uh the, the same way that we talk about you know um you know when it's sabbath and we have the sermon you know it's time to eat right it's time to to eat the the, the lord's food kind of a thing right the spiritual food so that's very much the imagery that's happening here but what do you think about the idea that the angel says where he says it will be sweet in your mouth, sweet like honey, but in your stomach, it will make you, it'll make it, it'll be bitter. What do you think that means? What's, uh, how do you interpret that? A lot of bad news coming. Yeah. But in the well, end, wouldn't but it be bitter even in your mouth as well then? Like it'd be bitter the yeah. whole way down. Well, it seems but, it, as if it starts sweet and then becomes bitter, right? Well, uh, is it is it bitter because the, the bitterness was mentioned first so bitter in your stomach which is the bad news and then sweet because of the eternal life the message is coming with it okay maybe perhaps so maybe it starts bitter and then when it comes out of your mouth it's sweet in that yeah. in that sense so so i, I was actually you know i could be seeing it in reverse yeah yeah it, it doesn't come out of your mouth it goes into your mouth and goes down right Mm -hmm. So it tastes sweet at first. Well, it because, depends, I right? Guess... If you take this symbolically as you, you ingest the message and then you give uh -huh. the message, right? In which case, it, it kind of would come out of your mouth again, right? Oh, okay. Um, but, take it uh, and eat it. I'm just looking at it where it says take it. Yeah, take and eat yeah. it. And it will make your stomach better but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Yeah. It, it is strange so, that it's backwards, guess, right? You would think that yeah. it would be sweet in your mouth and then it will become bitter, but he doesn't. He says that it will be bitter and then, you know, and then it will be sweet in your mouth. So it's, uh, it could be just a play of words at the same time. We don't know. Maybe, um, maybe. But, or the uh, interpretation, the way they interpret it. Yeah, is. yeah. Or oh, it um, could be suffering yeah. first, and then you know, with um, Jesus coming, the the you know, sweet right. Look, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could it be the bitterness of preaching a sweet gospel to the world? Uh, I mean, yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, so, for instance, you know, like the gospel, it's good news, so it's sweet in that sense. Uh, but the gospel can also make your life horrible, right? Miserable, because people are going to persecute. Yeah, but because there are those who will reject God. Yeah, exactly, right? So it could be the persecution that comes because you're preaching that word, right? Uh, in which case, it, it's it's as if, you know, it's, it becomes bitter in your stomach. Uh, any other ideas, though, of, of what it possibly can mean here? Yeah, so most of the um, most of the comment commentators I've read, it's, it's similar. It is to um, take in all that the book has, and then you have to relay that book. And many people will not want to hear, and and so it'll be disappointing to some extent because you're giving this very important message that is a delight to you, but yeah. yet many people are not responding to the message. So I'm not only not responding, but they'll, they'll want to persecute, right? persecute you and kill you. And uh, that will come up again later in, in chapter 11. Yeah. But yeah. what is in this little book? And that's the question, right? Uh, and oh, here comes Marcel. Let me add them in. Uh, let me read the last two verses here, because there's actually two more verses for the, just to wrap up this chapter. Uh, and let's see if maybe we can learn a little bit more. But that's the big question, right? The big question is, what is this book exactly? You know, what what is the message? We know it's an open book. Uh, it's a, it's an open little book that seems to come from heaven, right? That seems to be coming down from heaven by this angel. And God wants John to take it, right? He tells the angel to take it. So let me read here verses 10 and 11. 
Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. Uh, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, so that seems to show us, you know, it starts sweet, right? But when I had eaten it, it uh, in my stomach became bitter. So it starts sweet, becomes bitter, right? And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many people, nations, tongues, and kings, which I think gives us our first hint, at least, of what exactly is this little book, which must be those prophecy, right? <laughs> the prophesying. Um, what, what I, the one thing, and maybe someone can explain this that's maybe read this, verse 11 confuses me a little bit, the way that it's written, at least in the New King James, because it says, you must prophesy again about many people's nation tongues and kings uh i would assume that it would have been written like you must prophesy again to many people's nation tongues and kings right um so i'm not sure if maybe someone else's bible has it translated differently because the way that it's written like this sounds as if he's going to be prophesying about these people and nations and things like that um and maybe that is the way it's supposed to be. I'm not sure. But does anyone have a, a kind of a, what do you think about these two verses here? I heard um, something similar that um, you are, you become a Christian, but then because of persecution, um, you experience all these things. So it becomes bitter to mm -hmm. you in a sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think what comes to mind is um, with, with David and the, um, the honey that was in the animal and that it seems one way but the, the I think results... that was Samson right that it was the honey oh, yeah in the, in sorry the sorry yes, yes. I'm yeah. thinking you guys because we're doing David yeah sorry yeah, yeah. Samson kind of similar to that in a sense the, but the, the one thing that I could if I, if I was to compare this with uh you know the bible is actually Daniel himself right uh when, when Daniel receives the prophecies in a way, they're positive, right? Because God is explaining, no, you know, uh, there will be liberation, you know, there will be this salvation. Uh, but every time Daniel ends the prophecy, if you notice, he gets sick, right? He actually feels sick in his stomach because he realizes that, you know, Israel isn't going to go back in just a couple of years. You know, these are thousand year prophecies. And he realizes that he'll he'll never go back home, right? He's not going to walk the streets of Israel. He's not going to go into the temple. So even though it's a, it's a positive message, right? The the prophecies of Daniel of God one day being the king of this of this world, it actually hurts Daniel. It, it's bitter to him because the prophecy is still a lot into the future, right? So if I had to compare it with you know another book. I would actually compare it with that because, the, again, with Daniel, it was very much like that. So it's kind of sweet in the fact that God is in control. God has a plan. God has salvation prepared. However, it's bitter because, you know, Daniel, you're going to be long, long gone. You're going to be long dead before any of this actually takes place. Right. Uh, and that's why Daniel literally becomes sick at the end of every pro a prophecy. Um, you know, he, he's, he's in a really bad state, right? Uh, now it might not have anything to do with that, but, uh, that's at least the connection that I, that I kind of see, uh, with this idea of the honey and the bitterness. Anyone else, any other ideas here on verses 10 and 11? So using the preposition instead of, I mean, about instead of to, when God was giving Daniel the visions and the dreams, it was about nations and tribes and tongues and people. It was not something he had to give to them, but it was about the nations and so on. Okay. And I think John is using the same phraseology from Daniel about many peoples and nations because when, when God gave him, that's how he gave it to them, you know, like yeah. the four great beasts or four great nations. And so it's all about these nations yeah. that the vision is about. Yeah. And so it continues. <laughs> And John is picking it up using the same phraseology about many people's tongues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which makes sense, right? Because, um, yeah, I mean, the rest of Revelation is going to talk about kings and nations and 
powers and, and things like that, right? So I guess it's accurate. I, I just, I think usually when I, when I, when I read through it, I, I think I actually changed the word. I don't think I, I've, I've noticed the, the details of that before, right? You must preach, uh, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So again, the fact that there still is a lot of future ahead of John, right? There is going to be nations and tongues and peoples and kings in, you know, in his future still, uh, which for us, most of that is already in the past. But from John's perspective, it's, you know, there's still quite a long way from John's day to the second coming, right? Any, any final thoughts? This is uh, the, the end of Revelation 10. Uh, Revelation 11 kind of, I think, continues uh with uh with this message if we if we go let me go quickly here um because now it's uh in chapter 11 we're going to be talking about the two witnesses right uh which also prophesy and things like that so i i would i think most writers agree that this is kind of a continuation that this little book is very much connected to the message of of revelation uh 11. Uh, so it'll give us a bit more detail as in terms of what exactly that prophesying is, right? Uh, but anyone else, any any ideas, any final thoughts on, on what we've read here today, chapter 10? So uh, it reminds me that we here are discussing about these prophecies and we're talking about the nations, but we're not prophesying to them. Yeah. But we're just discussing what the book of Revelation is saying about these nations. Uh, just as Daniel talked about the great nations of his time. Mm -hmm. And so in our time, we are just talking about the prophecies of to these na about these nations. And of course, a couple will come up later on in, in terms of the beasts, the sea and the one on land and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, it actually makes a lot of sense. You know, once mm -hmm. you actually kind of stop and think about it, um, it, it does make a lot of sense. Um, so, so what do we learn? I mean, when, when we read through chapter 10, what's the message that God <clears throat> is giving us? What, what do you think with all the verses that we read, what was God trying to tell us in this chapter here? That we're not going to learn everything. We just have to keep trusting and holding on to him. Okay. That there is, I guess, a lot of messaging still to come, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That you know, there, that there will be trials and tribulations in this world, but you know we will overcome. So not to be surprised when the bitterness of this life and the um, the toil and the care, right? Because we know what the what the end is going to be. Yeah. I think that's really important because. You know, when, when you read through this chapter, yeah, I mean, John receives bitterness, right? He experiences bitterness, but who asked him to do that, right? It was God that led him there, right? It was God that asked him to eat that book, but he also gave him the warning ahead of time, right? So it's like, listen, this will become bitter for you, but I still want you to take it. Very similar, by the way, to something even like Gethsemane, right? Um you know, the, the, this cup is too bitter, you know, when Jesus is talking, if there's any other way and God says, well, no, I, you, you need to drink this, right? You need to experience this bitterness. So you can kind of see a parallel between Jesus' experience and, and the Christian experience, right? The fact that, yeah, you know, you will go through tough times. You will go through times of bitterness, but realize that that's still part of my plan, right? That that's something that that uh, I I need you to go through because it's developing who you are, right? It's 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 shaping your character and so on. Anyone else? Any any kind of ideas of of what this chapter brings for you? The one a change that, uh, is coming. I think it a change is coming. So uh, yeah, uh, I think that's a part of it, right? That you know, there's still things to come, right? There's still. There's still events that need to happen, even though we're right there at the end, right? We're right there at that last moment, but there is still some things that need to happen. Yeah. Ken, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, the part that um, strikes me is the part that says, um, 
but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, mm -hmm. the mystery of God is finished. And uh, when he say, when he take, when he's talking about this, he says, um, "Let me see." The verse before says, "And the sea and the things that are in it, mm -hmm. that there should be delay no longer." <clears throat> that there is not going to be any delay longer yeah is suggested we've come to the ending of the 2300 this prophecy in daniel mm -hmm. and so if the ending of that prophecy is around 1844 we say ending of 2300 days then this is telling us when we come to the ending of that period there is going to be delay no longer and when this and we're under the sixth trumpet yeah and yep. it says when the seventh is sounded God's work is closed up. It's done. So Jesus makes a statement in the Olivet Discourse when he says that we must watch and pray because, you know, we don't know when God is coming. It's going to be sudden. Mm -hmm. We're not going to know, mm -hmm. have any inclination. He says, for example, if the master of the house knew that a burglar would come to break in, he would have stood up all night and watched. Nobody knows. And yeah. so he says... The counsel was we must watch and pray because we're so close to the end. We need to be on guard. We need to watch and pray. And, and, and this particular section of it tells me that we need to be on guard. On guard, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think um, I think there's a very strong message. And, and you really see it throughout the book of Revelation, which is you have to be ready, right? You have to be ready um even if there's still prophecies to come because the fact is we don't know if we're going to be alive tomorrow right if we're going to be here tomorrow so there's a very strong message of be ready but i think especially as we reach this ending right um you know all the time prophecies have passed right the 2300 the 1670 or 90 uh all of those different prophecies they, they're all behind us right uh, there is no more, you know, in so many years or so many, uh, it can be tomorrow, you know, if God really wanted to. Uh, and so I think it really gives us that urgency of look at your life and be ready, you know, really get your, your house in order, get your heart in, in order because it's just around the corner, right? It's just there. Anyone else? Any kind of final thoughts? So we're still looking at what, what is in this little book? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what is the little book? Is it, is it uh, the scroll? What, what is this? Is this Daniel's book? What is the, the, the little book? Because we know that Daniel was told to seal yeah. the book. It's, it'll be open at the end of time. And of course, many of the commentators have um, come to the conclusion that, that this little book at least that opens here is the book of Daniel because yeah. God is now revealing what was closed and the fact that the, the, the phrase used about nation, tribes and so on is again used in this, in this used in Daniel, chapter. right? It's a reference to Daniel's sealed book. Yeah. But there are some people who believe that uh, this may be the scroll in chapter 5 that Jesus was given by God and um, Many of the commentators said, no, 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 it couldn't be the scroll because the scroll is so important that they would have said, instead of a little book, they would have used a definite article. The little book, the. yeah, yeah. It, it would so, be the little book and it would be Jesus holding the scroll, right? right. Uh, he's right. the only one worthy to hold it, so. Yeah, so some people like, for example, Stefanovich thinks of this scroll as, as a scroll of destiny. Mm. Um, some people think that this scroll, not the little book now, because they say that the word used for little book can also be used for <coughs> scroll. It's all mixed up. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of used interchangeably. But the, um, they don't believe that this little book is the same as a scroll. Yeah. So Tom Stad used a very broad view. He said the scroll, even though people say it might be. Uh, it may be the book of life that has the names of those who will be saved. Some people say it's the book of destiny. He says he doesn't believe any of those. What he believes is this scroll is a scroll of revelation. 
Mm -hmm. But God is revealing something that is, is necessary for us, something that we have to do with him. Okay? Yeah. And that's his, his take on the scroll of itself. Yeah. I yeah, thought it was the scroll of judgment. to find it out or? Is there a way of finding out? N not really. No. Um, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, should we try to find it out or leave it alone? Well, I, I think you should always study. Uh, I, I, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with study as long as it doesn't consume your life, right? Like if you start, if you start putting Jesus aside just to figure this out, then, then you've gone too far. Uh, but, but reading that, anything I'm thinking, in balance. I'm just thinking that there's, I don't, I don't know if there's any interpretation or anything to let us know what it is. That, yeah, that's my thinking. So that's why I'm saying, should we, should we concern ourselves with it? Just know yeah. that it's there and what we're being told. That's yeah. all I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. So I think what you suggest that we should study it because remember in the very first chapter in, in Revelation, um, the voice says, blessed is he who reads and he who hears the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Mm -hmm. So even though we may not understand what it means, but we have to keep those things in mind because I still keep the old traditional views in mind with the new views, but but I think as God reveals in the future, because I have this in mind, yeah, I would be able I'd be able to put two and two together to to know what it really means. Yeah, I mean, but there, he doesn't. There, there, he doesn't there's doesn't enough little hints, though. There's there's enough little hints. So yes, we know that it's it's connected to prophesying, right? Because it says so. You must continue prophesying about the nations and so on. Uh, we know that it's connected to the mystery of God, right? Yeah. Um, and we know that it's a, it's an open book now that is revealed, yeah. right? It's not secret. Uh, so it's something that we know already, right? That that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what what's interesting about this, even though it's not telling us what it is. That what it's is also it? saying yeah. that we do know what's in it. Like it's not a closed book. It's not a mystery. It's 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 knowledge that we have, so it's somewhere within the Bible, and that's why you know and that's why Ken says, and, and I agree with it. I, for me, there's three options really. Uh, for me, it's either Daniel, which I believe is probably the the my number one choice, or it's the Book of Revelation itself, right? Like this is the prophecies, right? He's being told to you know you're gonna you're gonna take this in and then you're gonna share it with the world. Or it's the Gospels, right? Because of that whole mystery of God. Um, for me, it, it's probably one of these three. Um, or kind of like Ken was saying, just the idea of prophecy. So kind of all the prophecies in the Bible are kind of this little book, right? Everything that kind of uh, is warning us about the future. So just that prophesying in general, that, 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 that revealing in general. Um, but the point is, we know it already so it's not a new message it's not a secret message or a hidden message it's something that we've already learned that we're supposed to eat it's sweet for us but as we teach it to others it can become bitter right if because of rejection and because of persecution and so on um so i think that that's the main thing it's not a new message so it's not you know the fourth angel's message or something like that no, they, it's something that we already know. That that's the key. It's a, it's an open book, not a closed one. Yeah, and I think chapter eleven will bring out some more mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. this whole business of what it really is. Yeah, it's the gospel. We know it's the gospel. Yeah, yeah. In a sense. Um, all right. So let me let me just stop recording here.